Russia will face a military onslaught, with the British media now reporting that warplanes and transport jets are being deployed to the UK's airbase in Cyprus. Lying just 100 kilometers from the Syrian coastline, the island is expected to become a launch point for a US-led campaign against the Assad government. Artis Tessarasilia reports from London. Various reports here have suggested that there is indeed a science of muscle flexing in the region, particularly surrounding Syria. Uh, it's been reported here by the Guardian newspaper that warplanes and military transporters have been moved to Britain's Akrotiri Air Base in Cyprus, as it, citing that two commercial pilots who regularly fly uh, from Larnaca, that's in Cyprus, have spotted C-130 transport planes from their aircraft, as well as detected small formations of possibly European uh, fighter jets from their radar screens. Now also, uh, The Guardian says that residents living near the airfield have confirmed to them that there's been an increase in activity in the area over the last 48 hours. Now it has to be noted that officials from the British airfield there have denied any military buildup uh, in the area. The U.S. has been ratcheting up its rhetoric as well. It's been reported by Reuters that the U.S. Navy was expanding its Mediterranean presence with a fourth ship capable of launching long-range subsonic cruise missiles to reach land targets in Syria. Now, we also know from the White House that Obama is weighing a military strike of limited scope and duration. It's been said that no, it will take no more than two days and involve sea-launched cruise missiles. Well, as far as international law is concerned, we know that up until this moment, there has been no military operations in Syria because there has been no agreement at the UN Security Council. However, now it seems that Turkey, Britain and France are saying that they can have a military operation even without the UN mandate. Uh, the French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius had said acting without the UN is possible and in some circumstances it can be bypassed. But international law is defined by the UN. Now, how exactly this will be interpreted will become clearer as we continue to follow this developing story around Syria. Well, the aggressive rhetoric from Washington has pushed it into another round of heated exchanges with Russia. The two countries joint effort, a planned conference in Geneva, aimed at brokering peace between the warring sides in Syria, is now close to collapse. Well, joining me live uh, is Artis Lusikafana for more on this. So, Lisa, tell us how have the two sides been reacting to the situation? Hi there. Well, as you mentioned, Russia and the U.S. had been scheduled to meet in The Hague on Wednesday. Now, this is to discuss setting up an international conference on finding a political solution to the crisis in Syria. Now, on Monday, a U.S. State Department official indicated that the meeting would be postponed because of ongoing consultations over an alleged chemical weapons attack in Syria. Now, Russia, meanwhile, had expressed regret about that decision. The deputy foreign minister uh, had said that uh, working out the political parameters for a resolution on Syria would be especially useful now with the threat of force hanging over that country. Uh, the Russian foreign, minister, uh, foreign Ministry spokesman had also issued a statement Tuesday in which he called on the international community to show, quote, prudence over the crisis and to observe international law, urging against a uh, potential military intervention. Now, the intense international pressure does come on the heels of reports of a chemical weapons strike that may have killed over a thousand people in Syria. Now, a team of UN experts had actually arrived to Damascus three days prior to that incident. They were supposed to investigate a different incident, and then there were reports of a mass poisoning in a suburb, uh, allegedly killing hundreds of people. The team did go on to investigate that attack, but came under fire on Monday as they were heading to the area. They were able to reach the site to collect samples and to interview some witnesses, but they weren't able to stay there very long, just in half an hour. And of course, we have to keep in mind that their mission's mandate is really to determine whether chemical weapons were used in the incident, not uh, to assign blame on who was responsible for using uh, those weapons. Now, in some of the most aggressive language used yet by the Washington administration, the Secretary of State John Kerry had accused the Syrian government of indiscriminate uh, slaughter of civilians and, and of uh, efforts to cover up uh, its responsibility for what he called a cowardly crime. Uh, he. Um, 
also uh, said that uh, the use of uh, weapons, uh, chemical weapons against civilians in Syria was undeniable and that the Obama administration would hold the Syrian government accountable for what he called a moral obscenity. Now, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has warned uh, very strongly against prejudgment about the use of chemical weapons. He also said that intervention or any potential intervention by the U.S. or its allies in the Syrian conflict without a U.N. resolution would be uh, what he called a very grave violation of international law and risk repeating past uh, mistakes. Uh, so he also uh, uh, sort of uh, raised some questions about the timing of the incident and why there was such uh, strong international pressure on action now as opposed to earlier when uh, the reports of uh, the alleged chemical, uh, separate chemical attack incident uh, had arisen. Right. Well, uh, a short while ago, a Syrian foreign minister gave a news conference. So what did he have to say on his government's position? That's right. Well, Walid Mualim, the Syrian foreign minister, uh, spoke in Damascus. Uh, he lashed out at the international community, uh, saying that Syria would defend itself with uh, what he called available means of attack. Unclear exactly what that'd be. Uh, he accused the British foreign minister of giving the wrong information to the public uh, about Syria's use of chemical weapons. He also claimed that the U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, had no evidence that Syria sanctioned the use of weapons. Uh, the Syrian foreign minister also went on to suggest that Israel would somehow benefit from any potential U.S.-led attack against this country, and uh, he rejected claims that the Syrian government had obstructed the work of uh, U.N. weapons inspectors, uh, saying, uh, he said, as a matter of fact, uh, they dealt with the inspection uh, team uh, with absolute transparency. So un unclear uh, if, if those remarks are going to make much of a difference uh, in the, uh, the uh, international decision-making process at the moment, but those are some of the things that he said in that press conference. All right, Lucy, thanks very much indeed for bringing us this update on the situation in and around Syria. Now, the director of uh, the Beirut Base Center for Middle East Studies, Hishar Raber, says the U.S. and its allies have hundreds of targets already lined up to strike in Syria. First option maybe is airstrike, you know, and it's difficult, complicated. And maybe land attack, it was not discussed. This strike may be... Even if, as we heard, it will be from the sea, you know, by uh, 200, 300 uh, cruise missiles and Tomahawk, uh, you know, where the target is, uh, you know, they have bank of targets. I, I assume that they do have 150 targets, you know, grade A, and they do have 300 targets, at least, you know, grade B. Now, the prospect of a devastating bombing campaign spearheaded by America with no United Nations mandate is starting to look inevitable for Syria. But what does history tell us about where this could be leading? Artis Ganech Chikan takes a look back at NATO's previous military ventures. The Obama administration is looking for ways to intervene in Syria without a mandate from the United Nations. The president's national security advisors bring up the NATO bombings of former Yugoslavia as a possible blueprint for an intervention in Syria. You may not remember, at the time, none of the NATO states that participated in the bombings of former Yugoslavia offered legal justifications for their actions. It was labeled a humanitarian intervention and with the help of a very one-sided media campaign it was engraved in the public memory, especially in the West, as a success story. And little has been reported that the humanitarian intervention turned into a humanitarian catastrophe on the ground. What some call a success was two months of bombings. Thousands of people dead as a result, both Serbs and Kosovo Albanians. When after 78 days of NATO bombings, Serb forces withdrew from Kosovo, there was an ethnic cleansing of nearly a quarter of a million Serbs and other minorities from Kosovo. Allied forces used cluster bombs, attacked civilian infrastructure, including power plants, bridges, factories, the headquarters of Serb radio and television in Belgrade, even the Chinese embassy, and yet, despite all the destruction and casualties, Washington saw it as a victory. With the same bravado, several years later, the U.S. made the case for a unilateral intervention in Iraq. In that case, it did not even bother to seek a U.N. approval. Washington presented false evidence and went on with the mission to remove Saddam Hussein from power. Nearly 200,000 Iraqis died as a result of that intervention. Millions lost their homes. 200,000 is a modest estimate. Iraqis continue to die in terror attacks every day. And most recently in Libya, 
NATO went beyond its UN mandate and effectively carried out a regime change. What was called a humanitarian intervention resulted in a nation engulfed in chaos and terror. Those are the precedents that Washington has to look back to when considering an action in Syria. In Washington, I'm Ganesh Chekhan. Well, I already spoke to Hans Blix, who headed the UN's weapon inspection team to Iraq before and during the 2003 U.S.-led invasion. He says Western media are now piling pressure on their governments to take action in Syria. I think that the public opinion and the media in the West uh, will be pressuring the, their governments to do something. They say that this is such a horrible thing that there must be a punishment, there must be action. You cannot sit with your hands just folded. So the public say that, you know, you must, we call for police, we call for a world police. But the question is, who is the world police? Is it the United States? Is it NATO? It should be the Security Council. And after an intervention, which could take place, I don't exclude that it's going to happen, what will they do? Will it just have been a punch on the nose and then telling the belligerents in Syria that they go back and continue to fight the war? The mandate is to establish whether chemical weapons have been used or not. And the way they go about that is that they go to sites and they may take samples of uh, dust and of water uh, and they will have to analyze that and send it to independent laboratories, two laboratories. They cannot just accept samples given to them from some rebels or from some site. That will not take them, t tell them who committed the attack, but at, at least it will be able to tell them that yes, chemicals were used. We see it as, in the main, as a contest between rebels and the government in Syria, but of course the intervention is there. It is in our between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And on that resting match, the U.S. Uh, is on the side of Saudi Arabia because they would like to isolate Iran. Certainly Saudi Arabia is not in, in Syria to work for human rights. It is there because they want to weaken Iran. That's the main purpose. I think the, yes, you, I think you're right in saying that Iran and, and the, and the U, uh, U.S. and Russia or to get together and to try to, to sort out and to get a solution for Syria. It might even make it less difficult to solve the nuclear problem concerning Iran. Now, the man dubbed Europe's last dictator doesn't take business breakups lightly, it seems. Coming up, we report on the arrest of a Russian potash company chief after he dared pull out of a partnership with a Belarusian state-owned firm. That's still to come here in RT.